I think photorealism would work well in an immersive experience, maybe. Immersive sims, I think, will benefit from the technology a lot more. Your Dishonored or your Prey or your Deus Ex series, those sort of things, I think will benefit from it more. But there are definitely genres that are not going to end up getting anything out of it. Let's say you have a fight outdoors. It's storming, and there's a 1 in 100% chance that lightning strikes in the area every, like round of combat mm -hmm. so you roll percentile one percent chance it's random but you roll the 100 lightning strikes where's the strike go off into the lands and find the adventure and see what happens uh, yeah. part of me still yearns to to see that played out alex do you know what time it is Oh, it is pebbling time. Yes. Clobbering time. Pebbling time. Whatever you want. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome, once again, to Total Pebble Knockdown. I'm Nathan. And I am Alex. And today, we're going to get into all of your pebbling time that you would want. I've been combing the internet lately, which is a scary thing to do. Don't... not recommend it. Um... But uh, I've been looking at some more tech demos recently of the uh, Unreal 5 engine and some of the, uh, the things that they're, they're doing with it. And um, as you know from previous conversations that we've had, uh, some of it is almost undistinguishable from uh, photography. It was on record we looked at last time? Yeah, we did. We did. Which looks very photorealistic. It, it does. It looks like you've got a real camera going to a real place. Yes, yes. There's a couple other ones. One that uh, was done is just a, a demo of going through a zen garden and the level of detail on the trees and the rain coming down. It, it, if you were to just show it to a random person, they would think that you were just taking a photograph, that you were just doing a video. Um, yeah. and, uh, and another one that I think is really interesting is, I don't know if you've seen, they're making a game that is based on the Titanic, uh, and so you can actually go around the Too entirety soon. of the Titanic. <laughs> the Titanic, they basically, uh, remade the whole Titanic, and they, they recreated it in Unreal 5, because you'll be able to go around the entire ship as part of the game. And it is uh, very stunning to look at, uh, you know, just in, in terms of what they were able to recreate. But the thought process came to me about what we actually look for in gaming experiences. And fun. Yes. Yeah, I think fun is usually the primary thing we're looking for. And, and yes. story and narrative and atmosphere and a lot of these other things that we, we want. Gameplay. Uh, everything like that, and I realized that realistically, the um, the graphic fidelity and the realism of it is not necessarily the big draw. When I start to think about the games that I really love, the graphics didn't seem to be a big make or break for me. Um, and so, as I went through looking at these photorealistic pictures, I was like, well, now this is really neat. This is really great, but I don't know if it's necessarily what I want from a gaming experience. If that's really yeah. going to be the thing that I actually want. So, yeah. I'm going to ask you, realism of the graphics and the sound design and all, all of those sort of things. How much does that factor into your enjoyment of a game? So, for me, graphics themselves aren't necessarily the big draw for a game. Obviously, I can play games like World of Warcraft that I still play. They're very stylized. Diablo, again, very stylized. Um, and enjoy them. And they're not, like, photorealistic. They are... Well, uh, for Warcraft, it's a lot more cartoony stylized than how it is. Diablo is a lot more realism-based, especially if you played Diablo 4 at all. It's a lot more realistic-looking, but still not photorealistic. Right. Like, just different stylization. So I think the big draw for me graphically is more stylization than it is, like, photorealism. And for me specifically, and I know this does not hold true for everyone, but for me, I don't really enjoy, like, pixelated 2D games. Or pixel games. 
Right. But I feel like, like thinking about it now, it's not necessarily that they're pixel graphics in the games. Right. It's more so I don't think I enjoy as much in the way of the either 2D or 2.5D games. Oh, um, okay. Because a lot of those are side scrollers or top mm-hmm. down, mm-hmm. and I don't have an issue with them a lot of times, especially like in old like uh, Pokemon type game. Those sure, top fill down. that in, and I enjoy those, you know. Mm-hmm. But for a lot of top down or two D or two point five D games like that, they are very simplistic in the things they do. Sure, e- even if you're playing like Stardew Valley, which is you know, 2.5D, I think, maybe 2D, top-down. I, I, I think it's considered 2, yeah, I think it's yeah. considered 2. Um, just the things you can do are very mundane. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I mean, but that is the nature, I think, of the mechanics more than anything else. Um, sure. It's interesting, though, because, like, I mean, I like I liked a lot of 2D games. Um, I like the old-school Metroidvania style of games. Uh, that are usually in that 2D uh, style. Um, I do like a lot of like the top-down farming games, which are also sort of in that style as well, um, or 2.5. It's it's on that plane, um, but I'm not exclusive to that. Like I I don't have a horse in the race for whether I, I like one or the other. Uh, it has to yeah. do a lot with the experience that's there, but the right. graphics, the graphics themselves don't necessarily inform it. Uh, for me, whether I'm going yeah. to like it or not. That's why, like, with Pokemon, the old ones, I can play those. It's an experience I think I've got nostalgia for. Right. But for newer games in, like, pixel graphics in 2D style, it's a lot harder to grab me because technology's come so far and graphics have come so far that this is not the gaming experience I generally seek out, despite loving Pokemon as a, like, a game. Sure. You know? Sure. Um... But then, like, as far as newer games go, like, uh, one of the ones I actually need to find a way to try is, like, uh, Minecraft with shaders. Oh, sure. If you've ever seen those, where it's, like, not photorealistic, but really, like, a lot better than just the blocky pixelated graphics. It is, like, nearly, like, photo quality, and it looks amazing, and I I would like to try that, because it looks like a totally different experience. Sure. Sure. Um... But yeah, I don't think photorealism is what I need in the game. I don't play any games that would benefit from that, really. Yeah, that's what I keep thinking about. Like, it, going back to Pokemon, I don't know if a photorealistic Pokemon game is going to make it any better. I mean, as we got experience. Pokemon, not Snap, we got Pokemon Go. Yeah. And if you t- turn on the AR camera, you've got that. But then imagine just these hyper realistic. A photorealistic Pokemon, and no one wants that. <laughs> that seems that seems like uh, it, it goes into an uncanny valley kind of territory that I don't want to go into. I, I kind yeah, of there's... hate the idea of a photorealistic Giardos coming out of the lake. Well, now you're gonna get one in the thumbnail for this because I think people have made those in art. Perfect. <laughs> for me, it's more style than it is uh like photorealism like even playing a game like elite dangerous which i enjoy immensely i don't think it would benefit from having photorealistic graphics yes at that point you land on a planet and then it's like ah yes i can see how ex- how photorealistic this barren wasteland is yeah yeah exactly um, I get a little bit concerned, like, even even some of my favorite games, like, some of those farming sims, is the photorealism really going to improve a Stardew Valley? Or, is, is or hell, is it going to improve, like, a, a Dark Souls or a Souls-like? I mean, that one, maybe just from the tone and the look of it, you know? I think photorealism would work well in an immersive experience, maybe. Immersive sims, I think will benefit from the technology a lot more your dishonored or your prey or your deus ex series those sort of things i think will benefit from it more but there are definitely genres that are not going to end up getting anything out of it like the borderlands series being the stylistic cell shading look that it has no one wants it as a, a photorealistic model. And in fact, when they originally were making Borderlands, it didn't have that style. 
it it was going to be a realistic style of graphics and when you see the original trailers for it you're like wow this looks bad like it literally yeah. it didn't look nearly as good as when they made a stylistic version of the game itself so if they yeah, were to go to that yeah remember originally the graphic style the, the way they styled borderlands threw me off of it entirely at the beginning mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i was like this is weird yeah yeah but, like you play it in like i didn't like borderlands one very much honestly personally it was um, rough i'm not gonna lie i, I played it a like, lot but yeah <laughs> but like looking at it as you like play it it's like all right no this is fine it's very stylized it is very in touch with what it's doing with the style and it yes. fits the style yeah. you know it's very comic booky and with the gratuitous humor they throw in there that tricks. yes exactly uh them and like the hi-fi rush and even when they did 13 um that kind of stylistic look uh, really matches with the idea of trying to do like a comic book presentation as they did as well. And it, it really got me to thinking that something I'm a little cautious about is if the photorealism of the graphics is going to give some of the bigger studios, like the AAA studios, license to not really be creative with what they do with the art and what would they do with the actual game itself. Because I'm more interested in the artistic quality of what they put into the game, and how they present the game. And uh, I, I can totally see a Call of Duty just kind of going, well, we've got cool waterfalls, uh, and uh, uh, oh, I mean, we're going to pre- pre- press A to win the game again. Like, we're you, back to Using Call shooting. of Duty as an example here is saying that, yeah, they're probably going to go for a photorealistic Call of Duty at some point. Yeah. Because they're just going to try to push it that much more into the... I don't even want to say immersive sim version, but, like, they want people to, like, play the game and go, oh, it's pretty. Yeah, As absolutely. they're murdering people. Yeah killing their friends um right but like i feel like a game like call of duty would be fine with photorealism it would probably be oh, a sure. bit gratuitous in points because you know photorealistic violence is kind of a it, probably going to be a touchy subject for you know lawmakers yes. <laughs> i think that's even one of the reasons in the re- on record footage like the faces are blurred like they, yeah. they even do a conscientious design decision to blur the faces of the, of yeah. the characters. Yeah, so you'll that. get into like the Call of Duty that's going to go, oh yeah, this is hyper realistic, you know, and it looks so real. You know, that type of game would be fine with it because it's doing something in a realistic environment. I guess it would be one of the genres of games that could probably benefit from it to a point, but I still yeah. think having a good art direction style instead of just going, ah, yes, the most realistic graphics we can do. Exactly. Yeah. Now, on the flip side, I think it would be really cool to have a game that uses these photorealistic graphics, mm-hmm. but also chooses to do some sort of art style with it. So yeah. then you could uh, then you could get a game that plays out like Sin City. Yeah, yeah. I was just starting to think about the idea of doing like a full black and white presentation with these splashes of color that come into yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be a very interesting idea. Um, they did do a game, Saboteur. I don't know if you ever played that one. Um, it was no. a, it was an open world game, and it was about Nazi occupied Paris, like an open world sandbox. And the whole thing that they did stylistically was the world is black and white, and as you liberate parts of Paris, they turn into like full color. And okay. so that was kind of like the big stylistic change that they did is that there's this muted color in the places that are currently occupied. And as you liberate those places, the color returns to those districts as you go through. Okay. Um, I could see that as being really interesting to do in more of a photorealistic style in those open, I think like open world, like those open sandbox games. It would be really interesting to see that. Um, even in terms of like a, a Far Cry, or anything like that. You know Ubisoft is going to try and use it as much as possible. Uh, for this they are. Um, what I guess, you know, circling back to what I was talking about before, though, I don't necessarily think that it's going to improve the overall game experience, besides no. the, the, the initial look of it. Um, Call of Duty is not going to, like, change 
the framework of, of the game or use the technology to expand what you can do in the game, it's pretty much still going to be the shooting experience that you expect. Going to be interesting when they do like the old historical battles and how realistic those look. Uh, which, yeah, will be very impressive in the moment, but when you get into the, like, multiplayer experience, <laughs> um, ends up being just as much of a, like, haywire mess as it, <laughs> multiplayer shooters usually end up being for me. On the one hand, the technology is just incredibly impressive, but on the other hand, I wonder if it's really going to be utilized in new and interesting ways, or if it's just going to be the thing that they do instead of making innovative game experiences. Um, on the bright side, we still have all the indie studios and developers that will make games that will make interesting style choices mm. uh, and innovative game designs for us. So we don't have to bet on AAA. That's true. That's true. I do kind of like, though, that I think even indie studios will have the tools of Unreal 5 available to them or whatever comes afterward, but we'll be able to, with those more robust tools uh, and, and small teams, still make something innovative and interesting and do something neat with it. Um, even in some of the uh, data that they did for like the MetaHuman uh, demo, they showed how it can even be applied to um, stylistic characters. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a photorealistic version, but if a voice actor comes in, gets a face scan, um, the, the muscles and everything that they do in their face can also be applied to essentially a cartoon version of that, and, and, or cartoon right. character if they wanted to. We're gonna hit the Uncanny Valley real hard when we do that. It's gonna be great. Can't wait to, yeah. can't wait to have those discussions. <laughs> We'll do an Uncanny Valley, uh, who, who wore it best at some point. Look at some of those metahuman things. <laughs> See, are we optimistic or are we pessimistic about the future of, uh, video game presentation with these tools? Uh, I'll be in the middle there somewhere. I think there's always room for something new. So, sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the positive side, uh, but I always take things with a grain of salt because I've been hurt too many times before, so... I'm mostly interested in what genre of games you think is going to benefit the most from a photorealistic graphic style. Uh, We're just going Elder Scrolls 6 photorealistic mode, let's go. Yes, let's see if we can do photorealism in the creation engine. Good luck with no, thanks. that. Uh, let us know in the comments down below. I don't know if you've noticed, but, uh, it is very hot. Uh, yeah. No, it's just a little bit. It's been, uh, 80s. Yep. Mid-80s. Mm-hmm. Upper mid-80s. 90s and some days, uh... Uh, we're doing this in Fahrenheit. For those of you in not Freedom Units, we don't know what that is, sorry, but it is way too hot. <laughs> We've actually been intermittently looking at, like, serious rain showers and then really oppressive heat. It's kind of like a, a constant back and forth between these two. Yeah. So much so that the river down the street from my place here has been flooding. Yeah. Um, sure, other rivers too, but, you know. Sure. It's the one that's nearby, so it's kind of an issue. Yeah. And because of those kind of extremes in weather changes, it has a tendency to influence a little bit of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the reason why we're talking about this is uh, when we get into a lot of tabletop gaming and we're sitting down at a table, we don't have a tendency to talk a lot about weather and how that affects the game. We can easily say what the weather is outside. Um, I gave you a set a little while back of, of weather dice, but there's no real mechanical or storytelling elements that we typically apply to it. It's kind of an afterthought, even though it's something we deal with a lot in the real world. I don't know if you have had any experiences playing games where the weather directly affected what was happening. I've had games where the weather is a set piece. Okay. Yeah. But it didn't really affect much of what was going on with the character. Yeah, yeah. Even in video games, we don't see it utilized a ton. I have seen some where, obviously, like in farming games, if you're if it's raining outside, you don't need to go in water. 
Um, and uh, I have seen some games where they will track the weather and it might influence some of your business. I played Tavern Master uh, for a little while and, um, you know, it affects the number of customers that come into your tavern on any given day if it's cloudy or rainy or whatever. Uh, and then, of course, you have some games like Frostpunk, where it is literally a mechanic of the game. Yes. Right. Frostpunk, it was very much an important factor in that game. So mechanically, Frostpunk did weather very well. Right, right. On a day-to-day -day basis, though, of, like, whether it's hot or cold or raining or anything, a lot of games don't really take into account how that's going to influence the story, how it's going to influence the mechanics moving forward. I will say, a series, a, not a series, but a section of gaming does take weather into account fairly often, mm -hmm. but not in the story factor, just in the mechanical factor, and that would be any survival game that has it's cold true. and heat as a mechanic. That's true. Survival games have a tendency to do that. I feel like it is one of the bigger afterthoughts of the genre, though, because I played uh, Arid for our live, and you can get sunburn, essentially, but if I rub some clay on me, I mitigate it. Uh, and there's not a lot of, like, changes in the weather from day to day, or, you know, yeah. uh, an, an adaptive or reactive world that you're in. A lot of times, they'll have games that uh, say, oh, well, it's cold right now, and the solution is you wear thermal gear, and now it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> and now you're me. not cold. Thermal makes you just perfectly temperature. Exactly. You're in perfect temperature, everything is fine. There's a section of Dead Space 3 where you're landing on a planet, and it's an ice planet. And you've been in space up until that point, which I would still think is pretty cold, but... When you land on this planet, you don't have thermal gear. And so you can only be outside in this snowstorm for a, a limited amount of time before you have to get to a base where you have to turn on, you know, the portable heating stations. Um, until, like, 10, 15 minutes later, when you unlock the gear that the thermal gear and now it's not a problem anymore and that mechanic never comes up again in the game <laughs> after that so you have this one section where you're desperate to find shelter from the storm and then after you get the right suit and it upgrades uh you never have to deal with that issue again for the rest of the game so it's very much just a a casual an occasional thing that is done to very gameplay, but it's not a continuous issue where things constantly change with the weather. And yeah. I wanted to think about some of the ways we might be able to actually utilize weather in a more interesting way in games. And uh, I, I go back to those weather dice thinking about this. If there was actually something that would apply to the landscape or to what the characters have to prepare for when we have a rainstorm. We have a thunderstorm. Do we have to think about the gear that we're carrying? Do we have to think about um, the landscape in general? If we're crossing over rivers or streams or we're in floodplains and there is a rainstorm, does it close off routes that we would normally take? And could you utilize that in an interesting storytelling capacity to veer people off of the normal path that they would go? You know. Um, what do you think we might be able to do from either a storytelling or a mechanical perspective to kind of use weather in a more interesting way to, to make tabletop gaming work? Oh, for tabletop, it's a lot different. For video games, there's either going to be one of two types of weather. It's going to be either scripted weather sequences that are going to happen and break things, for instance. A storm that is really big and scripted might destroy a bridge or a section, wash out a road, mm. which you can do. Scripted stuff, that would be fine. Uh, the harder part is if it's not scripted stuff, you have to have either the weather needs to be a physics thing. Yeah. In that case, or the weather needs to, like, not be able to actually affect anything permanently. Mm. So you couldn't have a random rainstorm in a game wash out a road if it's not scripted. I feel like that would be hard to do. Um, yeah. Tabletop, we can get away with a lot more mm -hmm. because the world is 
not real it's not rendered anywhere it's not physically taking up space not, i guess not physically it's not taking up space on a hard drive to compute that it's taking imagination maybe a little drawing if you do that maybe miniatures if you do that tabletop you can do a lot more you could have weather very drastically if you wanted to it depends on your world but you sure. could be like oh yeah there's a tornado mm -hmm. which I'm sure there are mechanics in most games to deal with different weather uh, for being, like, heavy winds, heavy rains, like, heat, sure, lightning is a thing. There's a lot of ways in tabletop you can make the weather actually better for storytelling and better for, like, dramatic set pieces or even actually have an effect on things. Let's say you have a fight outdoors, it's storming, and there's a... 1 in 100% chance that lightning strikes in the area every, like, round of combat. Mm hmm So you roll percentile, 1% chance, it's random, but you roll the 100, lightning strikes. Where does it strike? Nearby, you figure that out. It could be a set piece, it could be just random and terrifying. Sure. Sure. Um, maybe the entire enemy arm, enemy like crew gets lightning strikes a tree behind him and they all fall to the ground because lightning just coursed through their bodies and stunned them sure if not killing them sure um drop a tornado in the middle of, of a battlefield yep yep suddenly you've got a giant set piece that is also destructive and can create knockback <laughs> effects for that matter very either that or pull everyone in and throw them around that's also fun. And then there's fall damage that you have to take into account. Destructible environments, um, all of that good stuff. Um, yeah. There's there's lots of things you can do with weather. You could make it just uh, a story element. It's been hot. It's been hot for a month. It has not rained in two months. Rivers are drying up. The, the place we get our water from is empty. Yeah. It's a story element now. It is affecting right. everyone. You're having to ration water create water spells are like a gold mine but also those are drying up for some reason you could also utilize some of the mechanics that are actually in the game in an interesting way like i know in a dungeons and dragons you have certain spells like fire spells where you would be able to ignite certain flammable objects um mm -hmm. there's and uh, even like lightning bolt and spells like that will do something similar uh, going back to that lightning example, or even during an oppressive heat storm, you can play around with that mechanic. Uh, for instance, if there's oppressive heat, uh, there is a bigger danger of fire. Maybe it takes far less for any of those burnable surfaces to actually catch on fire. Yeah, or maybe you throw an errant firebolt and it catches a forest on fire. Right. And things that are not necessarily even flammable generally might start to become more of a, of a hassle. Um, if you have oppressive uh, rainstorms and such, I can see it washing out bridges. I could also see it um, flooding certain areas, which would uh, cut off entire trails of your, of your passageway. Um, and even in a more tactical sense, there's an interesting idea of like, you end up in muddy, wet marshlands, and it affects how much your party can move. It affects how much the enemies can move. Um, if you end up on ice, you might have to roll a percentile dice to see if you slip, or if you fall down, or even through the ice entirely. Um, Hailstorms also could end up being like cold damage, if you get hit by them, um, unless you make a constitution save or something to that effect. Uh, How big are these hailstones? Well, the size of a baseball, you say. Yes. This is always fun if you end up, like, on the mountains of, like, what is it, the spine of the world, where it's like, yeah. and, and then a gust of wind comes along. Does it knock you off? Yeah, and, um, uh-oh. <laughs> when you're on those, when you're on those really, really steep cliffs and the gust of wind comes, oh, no. That's not good. I feel like more often than not, weather comes into play when it's an issue. Less than right. when it's like... It's either an issue or hazard that you need to deal with. 
Mm -hmm. Or it's a set piece that just makes the scene more dramatic or more effective. It would be interesting to see it utilized in a more, um, maybe a more natural way. Like, for instance, something that, that's not extreme weather patterns, but just like, it's raining out today, and that that might help divert the party indoors so that they end up in taverns or inns or places where story elements can come into play and NPCs can be presented in a way that on a bright sunny day they might more or less be like out in bazaars and to like meet people that are out there in town and just have that as a piece that says you know we're we're just adding that element in to explain or inform to the group where they might want to go and then add in the story elements around that. Um, it doesn't have to be the, uh, you know, it's going to kill my party because we ended up in a landslide, you know. <laughs> Which, Although it could. You could still kill the party with a landslide. A total landslide knockdown, if you will. Yeah, I've, I've heard about those. Do you think that I'm, I'm overthinking this like I normally do? Or is it just uh, something we never talk this about? Time. No, okay, good. Yay. Not this time. I, I do feel like weather should play a part in games more often than it does for the general person, but I also feel like needing to obsess over every single detail of the world isn't really important either. Like, you don't need to make every single session, like, picture perfect. Sure. And if it's not going to be a set piece, then you're not going to describe the weather. Right. Like, unless you're calling out that it's raining, it's probably going to be assumed that it's nice weather. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. going to be assumed that it's nice. It's fine. It's not raining. It's not over. It's So it's generally called out when it is abnormal weather. Uh, even though rain is normal, you could make it a footnote. Be like, yeah, so it's raining, but that means... You know, travel is going to take a little, a little bit longer. Roads are going to be slicker. You're going to be a little bit slower. You sure. know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I just felt like it was one of those things that, uh, considering that you're doing this role-playing and trying to have somewhat of an immersive experience, it made sense that one of the biggest overarching pieces of your world-building is going to be what the actual world is doing and whether it is sort of the reactive dynamic part of the overworld and we don't have a tendency to really think a lot about it when we're playing games and it's uh, kind of a shame because i feel like adding in those elements where the weather really matters makes the game world feel far more um lived in for more realistic for the players and uh, like it's an actual place that they inhabit. It, it creates a life and a breath to that world that you normally would not get. Um, and it, it's usually kind of just tossed onto the side of the road because storytelling doesn't always involve the weather. Uh, small talk might, but <laughs> generally storytelling doesn't. And the mechanics of trying to work it out, I think, just get to be a little heady uh, when you're trying to simplify what you're doing in a game. Um, but uh, I'd like to think that there would be some creative ways that you could put it in. Uh, and I guess that's the question that I'm going to ask for anyone who might be looking to comment on this video. Is, do you have any creative ways that you can utilize weather in a game? And, uh, and have you tried those out? I'd be interested to know so that we can try to figure out if we can do that at some point <laughs> next time we play. Sometime in the distant future. <laughs> So Alex, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, I have a tendency to like that Borderlands series. I've noticed once or twice, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so recently I was able to pick up uh, Tiny Tina's Borderlands, uh, Wonderlands. I keep Wonderlands. wanting to say. <laughs> Wonderlands. You're thinking of Tales of the Borderlands, aren't you? I'm thinking of a million other things. It's part of, it's like part of the Borderlands series, but yeah, I uh, picked up Tiny Tina's Wonderlands and um, I've been tooling around with that game. And something interesting happens in the story, and I'm not going to give any like specific spoilers, but this might be a mild spoiler for folks that are out there, is that in the game, Tina is leading your character 
through this adventure that is in her wonderlands and it's in a game called bunkers and badasses and yes. and in this uh, particular game she's created like a whole narrative of what you actually do in the game and leading you through a quest against the dragon lord there's a point in the game fairly early on where you realize that the control of the game has gotten out of her hands and she doesn't even know what's going on anymore it's 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 taken on a life all of its own and i guess the thing that really struck me about that was how interesting it was that the person running the game would eventually get to a point where the control gets taken out of their hands and then they're trying to like scrape together to figure out how they they adjust for this random chaos that has now befallen the game itself and it wasn't from the players necessarily it was from the game world like the game itself and so i thought to myself we'll take a little thought experiment is there a way we could actually create what i'm going to call chaos mechanics sure into a game any thoughts lots of them uh Great. so i know you didn't really play much of three five ever no uh for D. &D. uh back in the old days there were these things called random encounters yes i do remember that and there were tables for random encounters lots of tables you could roll on oh you're going and you're wandering through the plains to adventuring roll on this random encounter table and see what you find oh mm -hmm. you're in the forest random encounter table um there was a random encounter table for pretty much any environment you were in including urban sure and so uh a way you could randomize a little bit of that and add some chaos and just random combat which you know uh people are hit or miss on um was that you could go hey i'm gonna roll you've been out here for a while not much going on you're just kind of traveling or whatever random encounter mm-hmm throw some chaos in there um the newer editions of D, D have kind of moved away from that largely i feel yeah I, I think that there's more of a curated experience that they're looking for from like i'm not sure about four but in five definitely it, it feels like that um, yeah so those are ways you can throw chaos in there but i feel like a lot of the players Newer players, especially, are looking for more of a crafted experience. So sure. throwing chaos in there is a bit harder with some groups than others, mm. especially in how the game is kind of played more or less in a, like overall scene as it's played. But you could absolutely throw stuff in there. I think it would be best to like make sure your party and your group is okay with that. Yeah. Um, because some people don't want, oh, you threw trolls at us for no reason. It's like, well, you guys just happen to wander into a troll's lair. They're they're you know probably gonna be trolls there. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's very typical. In the uh in the three point five rules, I'm just curious, do does the the DM actually decide when those encounters are going to come into play or are there actual rules of when you roll for the random encounters um i think the dm just kind of figures out when they're going to happen but i okay. think there's like a not a rule but like a suggestion there for every like two hours of travel or something like that over land you should roll at the encounter table or something oh okay okay something like that i don't know what it is it's been a while i cannot remember what the suggestion might have been for that but it's like yeah like if you're just looking for something to cause filler and like have them fight something you can roll um you know and they had a list of monsters from cr 1 fourth to cr like 10 sure perhaps. sure you know Really random. You don't know if you're going to fight a bat or a freaking frost giant. Perfect. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I ask only because if the, uh, if the GM is choosing when to actually do the random encounters, is it really random? Because the person who's running the game is deciding to throw a random encounter at the player. But if it's a mechanic of the game that creates randomness, then it's kind of out of the hands of the the GM who's running the yeah. game. Yeah, I mean, currently you could do some sort of randomness with like a uh, what is it? A chaos magic sorcerer? What is that one? 
Oh, um, a wild magic? Wild magic. Sword. Sorcery, um, yeah. Or you could throw wild magic zones in there, too. Those yep. are things that you can exist in. They can be pockets of wild magic. Yeah. Um, if you want a little bit of chaos. Sure, yeah. Didn't I end up... I think you had mentioned at one point when we were playing our campaign that we were actually in a wild magic zone at one point. Yes, when uh, you were I just in never the, uh, threw a spell. the gnome's home. Yeah, in Nomengard. We were in uh, Nomengard. Whatever it was, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, I, but I don't think I actually threw any spells at that time. You threw some spells, but they didn't trigger any wild magic oh, effects. Oh, okay. I rolled for that. Okay. Did you ever listen to uh, Adventure Zone? No. No, okay. So they did a campaign called Ethersea, and it was... Dungeons and Dragons, but it was a heavily modified one where they had a world that was under the ocean. One of the things that they did, they had their own ship, and they had like a preparedness rating for the ship. Uh, based on what rations that they had and some of the other equipment that they got and everything like that. Before they went out on a mission, the crew had to roll a, a 100-sided die. And there was a table. Basically, they roll the die, they get a number, and then their preparedness rating gets added to it. Like the, uh, it's like a stat bonus. And Griffin, who was running the game, had a list of essentially like 100 encounters. From 1 up to 100. And would basically, once we got a number established, would throw on the way from the main city to their mission, whatever that die roll said. And it was, uh, it was not just like a, uh, oh, you now have to fight these dudes. It was uh, NPCs that were introduced that would have not been introduced otherwise, big encounters that would then become something later that triggered these events early or in different ways, uh, uh, the uncovering of an ancient civilization, I believe, was actually one of the random encounters that they rolled for that ended okay. up being a whole thing in and of itself uh, that, that changes kind of the course of, of what happens in the game altogether. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was like an element of randomness that gets added in even though, you know, Griffin knew what all of these were. Yeah, it's a curated list, essentially, but you're not picking what you do by yourself, you're letting chance pick it. Right, right, you're you're leaving the luck to the players of figuring out yeah. what to do. Uh, so imagine if they just rolled the same number five times. Yeah, I don't know what you do. Wow, we, we have found five lost civilizations today. This yeah. has been astonishing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We only thought that there was one. We found five. What are we going to do now? <laughs> um, I, uh, I remember in the first campaign, they did something similar, which was when they were getting gear. And he created this, uh, essentially like a Gashapon machine. And these little capsules would come out, or big capsules. They'd spend their coin that they got from the, uh, the organization they were working for, and they'd throw it into the machine, and they would roll a die. And the, the die roll would determine the piece of equipment that they actually got. Uh, so it was randomized what kind of cool, magical piece of equipment that they got. Um, and when they talked to him about it, uh, he explained that while it does seem like you were getting good equipment for your character class, um, what, what I did is I created a random item list for each one of your characters. So, you. so, you know, you have a cleric and you have a wizard and you have a fighter. I didn't really want to give, like, the wizard stuff to the fighter class, but I did want it to be random what item that would work for a fighter you got uh, out of like a list of 20 different items or something like that. I just think that it's an interesting thing, even from a challenge of the dungeon master or the game master or storyteller to create uh, these, these chaos mechanics that are legitimately out of their own hands to modify and change the story entirely. 
in ways that they didn't plan on. And I can see it being scary, especially for people who are new to it. Um, after you've created your big campaign and leaving chance to decide so much of what happens in the game. But I think it could be fun if you have the right group. How random do you think we should really get with uh, the GMing experience? I guess the question is, do you want it to seem random, or do you want it to seem natural? I keep coming back to that, like, old-school, original Dungeons & Dragons, Gygaxian framework of the big living game world that's a one-to-one, -one, like, time frame. And I, I, yeah. think, I think in those where players can go anywhere and do anything, those random elements uh, are, like, everything to me being able yes. to throw them in all over the place uh, and yeah. just see and, what and happens. a big open world like that, the random elements are important because it makes the world feel alive. In a curated game world, they are less important because players want the things to feel impactful. Right. They want the story. That's the argument that player deaths need to have meaning. Sure. You know, it's the argument that everything that happens in the story has to be impactful and have meaning. Sure. So, yeah. throwing in random elements like that, that don't have meaning, is something some play, uh, parties and the players don't want. You know, and if yeah. you're going for a highly crafted experience, I can understand that. Sure. Sure. Uh, but at the same point, if you're going for something that feels more real world, like not real world, but like a living, breathing world. Sure. I like throwing events and stuff in my game worlds that it's not necessarily a random encounter, but should you encounter this, it doesn't matter what level you are. We've been over this. Mm -hmm. It does not matter what level you go to this dragon's den. The dragon there is still going to be the level the dragon is. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is going back to that Oblivion v. Skyrim way of doing uh, world building. Where yeah. in, in your Oblivion, things will scale to the player. And in Skyrim, it's more that the everything is to a scale that you have to deal with. And yeah. your, your player has to just get better at doing stuff <laughs> in order to handle it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do think that it has a lot to do with the campaign that you're doing and how you're playing. I think in the modern context of how we typically play games now, what people are probably more familiar with with 5e, or if you're watching like live plays and streams, it the random part is less important than it was in older iterations. But a part of me really does yearn to be able to actually see and play that old school version of the game where you did have like this one big world that you inhabited and just kind of go off into the lands and find the adventure and see what happens. Uh, yeah. Part of me still yearns to, to see that played out. And in so doing, um, yeah, I think that the randomization of it is is everything. I do entire quests that are all randomized on on the roll of a die, you know, yeah. entire storylines, NPCs, make it make it as random as you possibly can. Less prep work. That's definitely yeah. no prep work essentially. No. no prep work. You just you just throw a bunch of stuff on some lists and you just go with it. It's all on the fly at that point. All improv. Let's go. Let's go. Just uh, like this show. Yeah, exactly. All improv. Okay, I need a bad guy and I need a weather pattern and I need an occupation from the crowd. <laughs> Let's yes and this all day long. So I'm gonna yes and this to the uh, folks that are out there. Uh, what are some of the random elements that you'd like to see introduced to games, and how do you plan on implementing them? Or what do you do about random elements that crop up that you don't expect? Yeah, how do you handle the randomness of the world? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. So, uh, this has been incredibly random. We had random weather patterns random graphic displays and random game mastering rng has been a lot of fun to play but if somebody was looking for more about tpk alex where could they go on the internet you can go to a random assortment of numbers and letters at the internet yep also known as 
t uh totalbubblenockdown.com yeah and when you go there there's a whole bunch of random stuff that we do uh every episode of the show is over there you can also check out titanium mine and creatures when you are there check out our patreon if you want to get early releases of the entire video format podcast ahead of schedule as well as some of the extra stuff that's usually cut out of the show some behind the scenes stuff uh, and uh, feel free to check us out on every podcast app known to mankind. You can rate and review and subscribe at the ones where it's applicable. And also check us out on social media. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and our show is at Pebble Knockdown. So check us out over there, and we will see you at the movies. Well, we don't actually talk about movies a lot on this podcast. No, we're not a movie review channel, I'm sorry. No, <clears throat> we're not even a game review channel. We don't review mm -hmm. things. Um, yet. The, w yet. Wait, there's a. There's probably going to be a new segment at some point. We'll review. Great. I don't do reviews. Do you think I do analytical deep dives into games? Oh my god. Can you believe if we could actually analyze things correctly? Correctly? No, no. You, you imagine if I could analyze things in general. Oh, wow. You'd be, uh, you'd be the curator of a museum. I think that it's actually a blessing in disguise that you can. Now that I think of that. I don't think it's disguised at all. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everybody. We will see you on the next one. Goodbye for now. Bye.